folks, and welcome to this week's episode of The Big Show with Chris Moe. I am he who has already now previously been mentioned, Chris Moe. It is Sunday, May the 1st, 2016, 7 o'clock on the dot in the post meridian and i am coming to you from big show studios aka the big show production compound aka the upstairs room here in our home in beautiful lafayette louisiana the hub city the heart of cajun country hope you're doing great hope you're safe we here in south louisiana and of course over in neighboring tejas there have been quite a bit uh, or has been quite a bit of rain over the last 24 or 36 hours and more on the way so lots of folks in danger um and i believe some lives lost so you know if you're in those areas, please be careful. Uh, don't go through that standing water because uh, unless you you have some kind of like transforming car that can walk across it as a robot or you have a shield flying car like Nick Fury does or, you know, don't, don't try it. OK, just try not to uh, try not to go through that water unless you have uh, maybe a truck or something. But even then, you shouldn't you should really play it safe. Kids, I'm going to just uh, start this right at the top of the hour here. This <laughs> This is uh, embarrassing and highly frustrating, and I'm trying to to hide my frustration. I uh, I stopped my first run at this week's show earlier, about an hour ago. I stopped it, and I said, nah, I need to restart. Sometimes you just, when you're doing a show like this, you feel, oh, something's off, or I forgot to mention something, or I don't like that, so let me start over. It was only about nine minutes in. So then I stopped, I deleted that, and I thought I hit record. <laughs> and guess what, kids? didn't hit record so 30 minutes in to the second try uh i look over to see how my time is going and where i am because i try to keep to about you know an hour at tops if i can help it and nothing no recording so i've been talking essentially to myself for about 30 minutes so i feel like a moron highly annoyed because that show there which was good by the way like i liked it not even recorded doesn't exist it's like i just did a show for myself and that's not why i do it that's that's not why i'm doing this show kids so uh anyway so we're gonna try third time as the charm that's what they say right who are these people that say this well why why can't they get things right the first time what's wrong with them anyway uh kids we had some big news that hit on Friday, and that is going to be kind of the focus of this week's uh, episode. It is the news that Netflix has greenlit, greenlighted, whatever it would be, a Punisher Netflix series. So this is exciting. John Bernthal, of course, will reprise his role as Frank Castle in The Punisher. And I'm going to talk about later in the show some of my favorite Punisher arcs, all of which you can in storylines that you can find uh, over on the Amazon.com. So I'll be talking about that, and we're going to talk about some stuff in the Geek Peak. Uh, and I'm I'm trying something new, kids. As you may have noticed, if you follow uh, on Facebook, I've been shooting video this week. I'm trying to do more with Big Show Video because what I understand is the youngins uh, today, the youngsters, they enjoy that video, that video they got. And so I've been trying to do more. And you know, for uh, the whole length of the the life of this show, which is a little over a year, I've been saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some more content. And I had a little bit of content on Big Show Video, which is the official YouTube channel of the Big Show with Chris Mo, but I didn't have. Um, I just didn't make time. Now I'm making time. And I have filmed some video that I put up last week. And this weekend, my youngest daughter, Camille, made her first communion. So we I didn't really get a chance to do any work uh, on the video. Uh, but I am putting up some tomorrow. Here's what I'm doing, kids. Two things that I think are really cool. First of all, it turns out I've heard that there are people who like to listen to podcasts through the YouTubes. Who would have known? I did not know that. But my tech savvy friend, Michael Kreitzer of Iconicast, and he's also my co-host on Superman Lives, he let me know that. So I was like, oh, OK, great. So I am going to put up this week's episode of The Big Show with Chris Moe, the full episode on YouTube. You'll be able to listen to it there. And then I am going to take now this is the first time. So I, I'm hoping it will work out. I'm going to take a segment from The Big Show with Chris Moe, and I'm going to put it on YouTube as a video with some accompanying photos and that of course will be the first in a three-part series of presidential big show top 10 so uh that'll be a part of this week's monologue so look for that tomorrow and maybe you're watching the maybe you're hearing this right now it's already up on youtube and so just look around for the related videos there on the side and you'll find that big show uh top 10 segment and i'm going to do this from the few from now on i'm going to throw a segment up from the show uh with photos or maybe video just video myself uh doing a segment so we'll see how that works um but certainly i will put it up that way 
there's additional content for those folks who've never listened to a whole show and they can take in a little chunk and go, oh, what, what is this? What, what is the big show? What's a reflection uh, in a few minutes? Show me what this big show with Chris Moe is all about. So that's what that is. All right, kids, uh, we are going to take a break. When we get back, we are going to jump right in to this week's big show monologue. <laughs> kids i'm back and i hope you are as well by the way that is the amazing music of the u.s army blues the official big band and jazz band of the united states army so please check them out as always i have a link in the show notes to their site and their music is open uh, source so i've been able to use it as the big show with chris moe's music and they are phenomenally talented and they are serving our country so thank you i don't know if any of them are listening to the show i kind of doubt it but to all servicemen and women who might be listening thank you for your service what you do is a tremendous and heroic and it allows a schmuck like me to be able to do this little crazy funky podcast so thank you for your service all right kids let's jump right in now uh what i've done in the last probably year of this show is i've taken a number of shots not even uh small shots big shots at a company called mcdonald's and i've done that with pretty much with extreme prejudice. Why? Because they are a sponsor. The moment they become a sponsor, then of course I would have to in, in, you know, I'm a man of deep principles, so I would, I would have to immediately reevaluate uh, how I talk about them. But since they aren't, I can bash them, right? No. Yes. So that's how comedy works. And um, this week though, no, no, wait, hang on a second. What? Okay, folks, let me just, God, if you're if you're a regular listener to The Big Show with Chris Moe, you know that one of my imaginary production staff, Steve, he has been a pain in the ass for the last few weeks. And I told him, I said, this this week's it. and But now he's interrupting me yet again during a monologue. And I, hang on. What's the problem now? What? No, that doesn't, that that does not factor. In fact, that that is even more indemnification for me to be able to do this. He's saying, well, don't you eat at Burger King? Shouldn't you be attacking them either? He'll say that, oh, you shouldn't be talking about McDonald's. Don't you eat there? Yes, I eat at McDonald's occasionally, but that doesn't mean I can't bash them because, again, they're not giving me money not to bash them. And, and what? Yes. And also, a Burger King, he's saying, well, you should probably not say this about Burger King. What if they want to become a sponsor? I don't think I don't think we're in danger of that happening. You're aware of this show, right? I mean, you don't come to staff meetings. You don't come to the writer's room. You don't, uh, you're, you know, you're supposed to edit this. You edit the show plan. No. Oh, wow. There's always an excuse with you people. Okay. And by you people, I mean these millennials. Now, I don't want to be one of these guys, one of these ageists, like, oh, these youngsters, they're all terrible. But I've had problems with this guy. I, you know what? It's unfair to millennials, and I apologize. The kind of person that you are is you're just a slacker, man. You got to get it together. Okay. All right. Okay. So, anyway, uh, I think I'm okay with a, a Burger King joke, is my point. And he was saying that I'm not. All right, kids, let's jump right into it. So Burger King is, of course, uh, the topic here. And Burger King is launching chicken fries rings. These are ring-shaped nuggets made with all white meat chicken and coated in a lightly spiced crispy breading. Because, of course, who doesn't love the ring part of the chicken? <laughs> right? Wait a minute. There's no natural part of a chicken that is ring-shaped. I'm trying to think. What? Hold on again. No. No. No, I don't know. That's interesting. There, uh, One of my staff members there saying, could it be the eyes that's ring-shaped? That's more of a sphere. And then the, uh, what? That's a cylinder. Talking about the legs. It's round, yes, but it's long. It's a cylinder. No, nothing uh, on the outside of the animal is ring-shaped. So I would probably not want to ever eat it, even if it is fried and it somehow you know has a nice lightly spiced crispy breading moving on now this is a true story kids a man named sergey claimed that a beaver ran out of a bush and held him hostage according to latvian public broadcasting none of the male responders had any compassion for the man as they said they had all been held hostage by beavers themselves 
since puberty. So I think that, that is almost not even a joke. That's just that's just a life lesson for for you know young men, or maybe just an observation. I'm not sure. Moving on, a married Oregon pet shop worker paid a prostitute with cash from a Girl Scout donation jar, and then tipped her services with a small exotic monkey. The prostitute said the better tip would have been to not have to deal with her customer's little monkey at all. Hi-oh. So, yikes. Yo. Archaeologists in Taiwan have unearthed the 4,800-year-old human fossil of a mother cradling an infant in her arms. Larry King expressed relief on Twitter after seeing these photos, writing, Whew, Nope, that's not one of mine. Hi-oh. So... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what's what's that? You don't know who who Larry King is. How can, how is that possible? Have you you've been on the show now for at least six months? How do you not? I've talked about him before. I would say he's a recurring uh, target. How do you not know? Yes, he's had he's had a few wives, more than a few. Yes, he's old. Good lord. All right, moving on. Uh, finally, residents of Idaho. Have, Boise, Idaho, rather, report that at least 25 cats have disappeared from the area in the last few months, which, by the way, it's, God, that reminds me. Hang on. I just, I have a box here, and I keep forgetting. To, I have to do this right now, kids, because if I don't know, do it now, let me just put the packing label right on here, and we go ahead and fill out my name. Okay, and then I got to put my address here. And any, uh, I've got that already printed out. Just, I don't want a return address. Just have a nice box here ready. I had forgotten to fill out the label. All right, folks. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, first this is the first in a series of presidential Big Show Top 10s. This week is uh, the first one, and it's going to be up on the YouTubes, as I mentioned. So here we go. From the home office in Anacoco, Louisiana, the top 10 inanimate objects that would make better presidents than the 2016 candidates. Number 10. A bar of soap. Number nine, a shoestring. Number eight, a styrofoam cup. Number seven, an empty soda can. Number six, a pack of gum. Number five, a jar of mayonnaise. Number four, a used band aid. That's right, a used band aid better than anyone currently running for office this year. Number three, a soggy roll of toilet paper dropped in a toilet. Number two, a urinal cake. And number one, or no, and the number one inanimate object that would make a better president than any of the 2016 candidates, human poop. All right, folks, stick around. When we get back, we are going to dive right in to this week's edition of The Big Show Geek Peak. Folks, I'm back. Hope you are as well. Let's dive right in. Big Show Geek Peak, of course, at the top of the hour. I mentioned huge news that Marvel has greenlit a Punisher series for Netflix. I guess we can't even call these TV series anymore because that, that you might watch them on your device that isn't a television. So, you know, it's just a series. This is great news. Uh, I myself have always been a fan of the Punisher, and the movies, sadly, have been lacking, and that's being generous. Now, I think the first Punisher movie back in 1989, it was released on video in 1990. 19- 90, instead of going to theaters with Dolph Lundgren, I think that's probably the best one of the three. Okay, now a little background on that movie, very brief. Uh, Punisher at 90 or Punisher 89, however you want to look at it, was something that I remember reading about back then. There was no interwebs, right? When I when I was a kid, and uh, so I read about it on in, an, in a magazine called Comics Scene that t- that you know focused on comic books, but also comic book related films. This was the first Marvel movie. Okay, technically it it falls under uh, a Marvel movie, even though it's not a superhero, but it was the first adaptation of a Marvel character in movies, even though it never went to theaters. It had Dolph Lundgren. I remember reading about it and thinking this is really exciting. I thought it was odd then, and I still 
think it's odd now they never use the Punisher skull uh, but the but the show the movie itself is very much uh, even though it's not faithful to the comics it is a great 1980s action movie so in that regard it reminded me of like uh, enter the ninja and stuff like that that I watched you know when I was growing up and you know Dolph Lundgren I'd been a fan of course ever since he played Ivan Drago in uh, Rocky 4 and it had the great Louis Gossett Jr. who, you know, was in so many movies in the 80s and 90s and classes up a movie, I think. Even even this one, because he's not given a whole lot to do. But what he does do is great. So I, I recommend it. You can find it probably in the $5 bin at the, uh, you know, Wally World or wherever it is you buy movies. You can get it, I think, on Amazon.com. You can find it in a number of places. It's worth your money and your time. Now, we then had 2004 as The Punisher that had Thomas Jane, who's the best thing about that movie. And then we had uh, John Travolta as the villain. <laughs> you know, and uh, that movie, the last 17 minutes are actually a Punisher movie. So that, you know, <laughs> that's not a good thing, but that's a great part of the movie. Uh, it was awful, you know, most mostly awful. Then we move on, and I want to say it was in 2009 2010, somewhere in there, that we got Punisher Warzone, named after my favorite Punisher comic series, which was called Warzone. I'm going to talk about that later. And it had the great Ray Stevenson, who was in uh, HBO's Rome, and then he was, of course, would go on after playing the Punisher, which, sadly, the the, ser the, um, the script disserved him, and so he never played Frank Castle again. But he would go on to play Volstag in the Thor films, who's the big guy, you know, with the big beard who likes to eat. And he does a great job with Volstag. So, you know, I'm glad that he got another shot because he's a great actor and he's a beast of a man. You know, he was perfect for Frank Castle. So uh, that movie Warzone, for some reason, the director decided to turn it into like a campy almost like Batman 89. It's very colorful in some places and it's kind of broad and there's comedy that shouldn't be in a Punisher movie. So uh, the best thing about it is Ray Stevens, Stevenson rather, and his performance as the Punisher and the action. And uh, it's kind of like Superman Returns. The best part of that movie is Brandon Routh as Superman and Clark Kent. He does a phenomenal job. He was, of course, uh, done a disservice by the director and the script. So anyway, would I recommend uh, Warzone? Yes. If you've never seen it, check out Warzone. You can fast forward through great parts. You'll know which ones to fast forward through. They're very, very bad. And uh, the rest of the action, it's well worth it for the action. And then I would watch the whole Dolph Lundgren movie. And I would uh, maybe wait to see because they'll replay the 04 Punisher uh, on, I think, like uh, Spike or TNT every once in a while. Just TiVo it and then fast forward the last 17 minutes. And then that's all that's really worth watching there. Roughly 17 minutes. So this is great that we're going to finally see. This is how I think you crack this character because I think he needs... Uh, episodic storytelling because that's what Frank Castle does. He moves on from one mission to the other. That's kind of his raison d'etre, as it were. And so it's going to be great to see how that's going to uh, unfold here. Well, uh, there's also a Punisher teaser video that came out that's really brief, just has audio and then an image of the new skull design, which is really creepy. And I will put that up in the show notes, the link, so you can check it out. Moving on to the other big Marvel news, of course, Thursday, this Thursday evening, there will be the worldwide release of Captain America Civil War. Now, released overseas this past week, I believe, or maybe last week, uh, week before last, and it has already made around $38 million so far. All of the reviews that I have seen, with the exception of a few, have been extremely positive, and they, they are, again, as we've talked about before, uh, these folks are grading these movies generally if they're not a shill for a studio who are just doing it for like a kickback from the studio then you know they know something about movies and they're saying it's very well done very well written well performed and that it may be the best movie yet now my favorite movies have always been in the Marvel Cinematic Universe they've been Captain America films because he's my favorite Marvel character I love Iron Man uh, love the Avengers movies of course uh, Ant-Man I thought was great Guardians of the Galaxy Thor I, I never thought I'd see a Thor movie because as a kid I read all those comics and so if you just said Thor is going to have a movie much less two I'd have been like no he's not but it's great uh, and so but Cap has a special place in my heart and those movies to me are the best so 
I hope that this movie will continue to live up to that. And uh, we'll see what happens, kids. That's going to be next week. I will have a review for you of Captain America Civil War. It will be spoiler free, of course. Uh, There's been some news. Stan Lee will, of course, have a cameo in this film, but it will be the first cameo that Stan Lee does that's actually relevant to the story. Usually Stan appears in a movie and, you know, like in Iron Man, he was the Hugh Hefner kind of character. And he'll do something. You just see him in passing, like he's driving the truck trying to pull Mjolnir out of the crater in Thor. And it's like, nah, we don't really, this is not really critical to the story. This will be the first movie that his uh, cameo will be very important. Apparently, Stan will deliver some important information in Civil War. So we'll see what that's about next week. There will also be a uh, mid-credit and a post-credit scene, so two scenes, and you're going to want to stick around, kids, for that, so don't get up and leave right after the film. There's also what's uh, called by Fandango an ultimate franchise video. It's just kind of a little compilation of scenes from the Iron Man and Captain America films. Really well done. Link for you in the show notes. It's kind of a nice way to get you hyped up even more. Moving on to a studio that doesn't understand how to do superhero movies successfully television yes <laughs> animation yes movies live action movies no they're just it's like they're separate companies that of course is warner brothers first of all let me start off with the good news there is an official trailer now now for the killing joke batman the killing joke which is an animated film that's going to premiere at san diego comic-con this year and of course it's one of the greatest batman stories ever told it is extremely adult the movie itself will actually be r-rated so this is not for kiddies at all uh and you know it's written by the overrated i think alan moore he has often said he does not like the killing joke i personally think it's his best some of his best work um so that's kind of ironic but it's going to be great. It's got the great legendary Kevin Conroy from Batman, the animated series and some of the movies and the video games, the Arkham games. He returns to voice Bruce Wayne and the Batman. And we have the legendary Mark Hamill who will be voicing the Joker. And he is doing the audio you're going to hear. I'll have a link in the show notes in this trailer. will chill you, man. This is how you do the Joker. Uh, Jared Leto, Leto, however you pronounce his name. No, thank you. And and I, I mean, the only other guy who chilled me as the Joker was probably Jack Nicholson. I thought, you know, Heath Ledger did a good job, but it, but mm, there was something missing. Probably the fact that it was so realistic, you couldn't even have his his face, you know, stained by the the chemicals that he was just putting on paint. <laughs> so anyway. That's just me, though. Uh, so that video, I have a link for you in the show notes. Now, um, I have here some bad news, of course. This is the live action news. Director Seth Graham, I think it's pronounced Graham or Graham, Graham, I don't know, Smith, has dropped out. It was released this uh, Friday of Warner Brothers Flash movie over, quote, creative differences, unquote. This is according to The Hollywood Reporter. He signed on to the project in late 2015, and Ezra Miller, who plays The Flash briefly, from what I understand, I refuse to see it in Bad Flag v. Not So Superman. He is, uh, apparently he was going to play Barry Allen. Why you would get anyone else, nothing against Ezra Miller, why would you get anyone else to play Barry Allen when you have the amazing Grant Gustin making one of the most lovable superhero characters ever on screen in the Flash TV show on the CW? Why would you do that? I don't understand, man. It makes no sense. So uh, this is bad for this film. I really hope that it doesn't work out. But apparently, Warner Brothers has already said they're going to just move forward without him. The uh, script, he is a writer, by the way, Seth Graham Smith. Uh, he, of course, wrote uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, and then he wrote Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, neither of which I've read. He wrote the screenplays for both movie adaptations, and he was write, rewriting a script from Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. They, of course, wrote famously the Lego movie, which had no right to really be good, but it turned out to be a great movie. Uh, I don't think they were the best for The Flash, though, but anyway, he was going to rewrite it, and uh, now he is leaving the project over creative differences. Now, at first, kids, uh, I thought it was because this was going to be his first feature film as a director. He had never directed anything before. And I thought maybe he's he's backing out himself because he's a little nervous, gun shy. This is supposed to be a big, you know, tentpole film. Here's the deal, though. Devin Faraci, who is, you know, I love this guy's writing. He runs a site called Birth Movies Death. You got to check it out. He is a fan of the traditional iconic versions of the DC characters. And he has released some information himself this past weekend that 
not only was it not because he was a first time director, it was because there were problems with Zack Snyder and Warner Brothers over how Zack Snyder is putting together the Justice League movie. Apparently, Zack Snyder is not getting the message that people, even though it made a lot of money, that critics don't like this and that, you know, the repeat viewings just weren't there. So uh, I think it's good that this guy's leaving. He doesn't need to be a part of this sinking ship. Um, you know, I, I really just don't get it. Uh, this is the, the second movie that has had this happen. The first was Wonder Woman, which, of course, is, is uh, I think, either being filmed now or is about to start filming. And uh, the original director, Michelle McLaren, she departed over creative differences herself. And then over the weekend, it was uh, announced that James Wan, who, of course, directed Insidious, The Conjuring, he was going to be directing Aquaman, and now there are rumors that he's going to leave Aquaman over the same problem. By the way, in when you're talking about like Hollywood and, and behind the scenes, creative differences almost always is not the writer. It's usually the studio uh, or an executive producer or somebody else in television, the showrunner. It's usually one of them that says, no, we, we have this set in stone. We want you to do this. And, and often it's the writer who says, I'm just not going to be a part of this. Uh, this has happened in other high profile movies before. It happened in the Marvel Cinematic Universe um, when um, I'm forgetting his name all of a sudden, but the director original director of Ant-Man left and a lot of people thought that was going to be bad and it turned out to still be a very good movie uh, but you know when you have this happen almost three times perhaps three times something is wrong on a bigger level so we will see where this is all going moving on to general movie news new picks have been released from the upcoming Star Trek Beyond that's coming out this summer the third movie in the J.J. Abrams rebooted universe uh, I kind of like the first one hate the second one and I'm kind of ambivalent about this one. I'll go see it just because I'm, you know, a Star Trek fan. But uh, I do like the uniforms. They've kind of tweaked them a little bit to look a little less pajama-y than I thought they were in the last two. Uh, they've also got these cool leather blue, blue leather jacket type uniforms that look like the away team uniforms or the landing party back in those days uh, from the original Star Trek pilot, The Cage, which had Captain Christopher Pike instead of James Kirk. That... Uh, pilot was not purchased by NBC. They did a second pilot with, of course, the legendary William Shatner as Captain Kirk, and the rest is history. So, uh, you know, I think it could be a decent movie. Uh -huh, we'll see. I'm much more excited, as I talked about last episode uh, or episode before with Justin Vizay. We talked about the Star Trek series that'll be on CBS All Access. You can check that out in the uh, archives. Really good talk that we had with Justin. Now, this is another series of movies that as a kid growing up in the late, you know, uh, the 80s and into the 90s, always loved the Alien series. The first Alien directed by the great Ridley Scott. Then you had Aliens directed by James Cameron, who, of course, went on to become legendary himself. Uh, and then the Alien 3 film and Alien 4, eh, Alien Resurrection, he, uh, you know, the, the less we say about those, the better. It was released last year, and I talked Talked about it on the show that there would be an alien five and that radically it would not acknowledge alien three and alien resurrection and a lot of speculation began among fans how's that going to happen are they going to just ignore those movies like superman returns did with superman three and four are they going to say that those movies were dreams are they going to say you know who knows well now we know a little bit more uh at least allegedly first of all let me talk about alien covenant now a lot of people didn't like Prometheus, which was Ridley Scott's movie that was designed to be the first of a series of se of prequels to the original Alien. And, uh, whoa. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little technical difficulty there. Uh, and so Prometheus, I enjoyed. It, it didn't get the best critical reception, but I thought it was a good movie. Uh, for some reason, the studio, Fox, said, now you need to have the title Alien in the name of the movie. You can't just call it Prometheus uh, or two. You have to call it Alien something. So now it's called Alien Covenant. I reported on this last, uh, ooh, about 10 episodes ago when it first came out. The Covenant is the name of the ship that is in this movie. Prometheus was the name of the ship in the first movie. And uh, so, you know, eh, I don't know why they need to put Alien in front of it. They should have just called it Covenant. Uh, the original title was rumored to be Paradise, which is fitting in with the theme of the movie. Uh, and... So 
this movie is being filmed right now. They released a picture of the crew patch of the spaceship um, Covenant. And here's the thing. This movie is going to be coming out, uh, I want to say sometime later this year, and there's going to be two or maybe three more movies that will be a prequel to the first Alien movie. And Alien 5 is going to not be filmed until Covenant is done. And I think only done. I don't think they have to wait until it releases. So here's the deal. Ridley Scott asked Neil Blomkamp, who is going to direct Alien Covenant. He, of course, came to fame with the excellent sci-fi movie District 9. You may have seen that. And, of course, Chappie, which I never saw. And another one in there that I'm forgetting. But anyway, um, he asked Neil Blomkamp to wait and not do this movie until Alien Covenant is done with production. So uh, Sigourney Weaver revealed this past uh, week that Michael Bean, who, of course, played uh, Hicks, in the great aliens right he is going to be back in there now hicks was killed and so was newt and then so was ripley in alien 3 uh but now they are going to be back and she says i think the part of hicks is beautifully written this marine with a great heart and strength and intelligence in a neil blomkamp sequel we'll see a lot more of them together we have to wait until after prometheus 2 is made okay then she goes on this is interesting she talks about how she came aboard alien 5 neil blomkamp started to talk to me about the sequel to aliens and i thought that would be great to know that ripley has a resting place eventually wouldn't it be great to end the series on not that the other two didn't happen but they're in a parallel universe now here's the thing kids you know it's kind of like what they did with star trek 09 where they spun it off into an alternate universe i don't have a problem with that but here's my problem that i do have with this announcement knowing not as much as we're going to know later why would you do this uh in kind of a convoluted way if you're just going to kill ripley off again why do we have this you know, an actor says, I don't want to play a part, so we kill her off. Happened in Alien 3. Then an actor says, hey, you know, I like uh, money, so I would like to come back as this character. So then they brought her back as a clone of Ripley in Alien Resurrection. Now she is older. It's been about, uh, that was what, Alien? That might have almost been 10 plus years ago. So she's getting older and probably has said, I don't want to play Ripley again after this time. Why would you not leave her alive, just write her out of the movies and move on with new characters? when she could change her mind again and fans might say well we want to see ripley again well now how do we bring her back to life again well maybe another alternate universe no just keep her alive don't show her final don't f show her death Sh write her out and then move on do more movies with uh hicks and newt who production uh art has been released also this past week showing an older uh newt in a uniform uh, I don't know if it's Colonial Marines or what. So she is going to probably be played by, you know, a 25, 30 year old actress uh, because that would be about her age after the first movie. Newt was the girl that was uh, the last survivor of the colony on LV-426 and Aliens. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with this. I mean, I want it to be good, but alternate universe and killing Ripley again. Yee, I don't know. I don't know how good that'll be. Kids, that I do know is the end of this week's Geek Peak. When we get back, I am I'm going to give you my picks for some of the best Punisher stories, some that would make great episodes, arcs, maybe seasons of a Punisher show, and some that, while they wouldn't fit in there, are still worth your time and your money. If society won't punish the guilty, he will. You see this board here? Every time he kills somebody, I put a red pin in So far, the only thing that I've got to shoot for is these little calling cards here and a whole bunch of these. Now, let me tell you something about this Punisher. If he ever shows up within 1,000 yards of me, You'll find out what the word punished really means. He defends the innocent. But if you are guilty, he gives no warning and shows no mercy. What the hell is this? Trouble. Dolph Lundgren, Louis Gossett Jr. Mr. P, happy hunting! 
The Punisher. Justice with a vengeance. That's the wonderfully 80s trailer for the uh, Punisher 1989 with Dolph Lundgren and, of course, Louis Gossett Jr., who classed up that movie a lot. So check it out, man. You can find it. In fact, let me let me go right now, kids, to the interwebs and see uh, where what 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 is the current status of this movie on Amazon? Like what? How is it available? I'm curious. And I didn't look that up before the show. My staff also didn't do it. That's why they need to be fired. Here we go. I'm looking here. It looks like you. Uh, wow. looks like. Like when you even oh, okay, there's a new Blu-ray version. Looky there, kids! I did not know that. Uh, there's a new Blu-ray version of the Punisher film of 1989, and uh, so yeah, check it out, man. It's got a really cool cover and everything. Um, Punisher 89, as I said earlier, is a good movie worth your time. And there are some middling to bad Punisher comics. It's kind of the same as the movies, and so that's why I wanted to talk about some of the best because here's what happened. Um, back in the late 70s or maybe the early 80s, the Punisher was uh, introduced in the pages of The Amazing Spider-Man. He was a Spider-Man villain, and he was just kind of portrayed as a crazy guy. You know, he had high-tech uh, weaponry. And then later on, he was brought back in a miniseries, as was done with Wolverine, who was an X-Men. And then it was kind of bandied about, would he be a good regular series character? And, of course, Wolverine in the great uh miniseries written by Chris Claremont and art by Frank Miller. Great series. Should have been a better movie. Never happened. But anyway, uh, The Punisher got his own miniseries and he became instantly super popular because this was the late 80s. Uh, you know, Death Wish, Dirty Harry, revenge movies were huge. People, I think, were just upset and they were not really um, happy with the justice system at the time. And so The Punisher was extremely relevant to them. And so Marvel put out the Punisher, then they put out Punisher, uh, I want to say Punisher uh, War, not War Zone, War Journal. Then there was the Punisher Armory, which was a really cool book that that showed you, um, you know, his arsenal and, and had some really cool articles written from Frank's perspective about his weapons and the equipment he uses. And then Punisher War Zone and then Marvel overdid it, right? Because when we can make money from uh, something, let's put it out as much of it as we can. And then once that happened, uh, they said, we got to get rid of Frank Castle. There was a point where they actually had a storyline where there was a female Punisher. Then there was a guy who was like a, you know, kind of a Batman version of Punisher. He was a, a billionaire, but he was crazy and he had you know high-tech equipment and they did that then they tried to change they actually changed the punisher's ethnicity the first storyline which you know should have been the writing on the wall and it wasn't long after that that they killed frank castle right uh and after that they brought him back as an avenging supernatural character i think he worked for hell or heaven or some angel i don't remember i didn't read any of it really i read about it so uh then they brought him back to life apparently in that story he made the deal i will uh kill these people if i can come back to life and uh at the end of the story frank is given the chance to rejoin his family in heaven and he chose to go back to earth because there were still more people to punish so eh, i don't i don't think any of that should be even acknowledged that's not something you do with this character and then there was a series called punisher max and this took the punisher out of the marvel universe and it basically was an R-rated version of The Punisher. Fantastic. So some of those I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and now The Punisher, I don't keep up with the current issues because they've kind of gone back to putting him in the Marvel Universe. I don't think The Punisher belongs there, but that's just me. Well, the first uh, recommendation I have is Punisher Circle of Blood. Now, this was the initial miniseries I talked about, written by Stephen Grant and art by the wonderful, legendary Mike Zeck. You've seen Mike Zeck artwork. Uh, even if you're not a comic fan, you've seen it on posters. His 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 initial poster for this uh, circle of blood, this this um, 
miniseries, I can remember seeing the poster at like uh, Spencer's in the mall when I was growing up. So it was everywhere. It was on T-shirts. It was very, very popular art. He also has done some tremendous work with Batman. He did another iconic uh, piece that has Wolverine slashing his claws down and there are sparks flying as Captain America holds his shield up. And that went on to be T-shirts and posters as well. So you've probably seen his artwork. Wonderful story. He did the interiors. He did the exteriors. There's one issue where he doesn't do the art. It's kind of off, takes you out of the story, but still very solidly done. And this is a 20 plus year old storyline, 30 years probably, that holds up. So it would be great if they launched this new Punisher series with Circle of Blood. They couldn't do, uh, I think, necessarily any better. The next one is Punisher War Zone. Now, this is really strange to me. Marvel and any comic company will reuse the title or a subtitle. So they've had three or four different Punisher Warzone series. Uh, and the first one was the best, I think. I haven't read all the others, but the first one was the best. And the the first six issues are the launch of this new series. It's written by the great Chuck Dixon and art by John Romita Jr. And here's the deal. Uh, I went on Amazon during the, the last break to see what it was going for on Amazon, $77 used and new is, I think, even more. I don't know why, kids. You go over to eBay and you search Punisher Warzone Chuck Dixon, D-I-X-O-N, and you're going to find these issues separately or as a trade much cheaper. So don't, I don't know why Amazon doesn't have, it's out of print. The collection is out of print, but the regular issues are cheap individually. If you live in a town with a really big comic shop that has a nice, you know, long uh, back issue bin selection, you'll be able to find these issues and probably not pay a whole lot. Well worth it. The story in this one is that Frank Castle decides to infiltrate a mafia family and destroy them from within by pretending to be uh, an enforcer that wants to switch families. That's all I'm going to say about it, man. It is brutal. It is not part of Punisher Max, which had like, you know, nudity and cursing and extreme violence, but it, it is very violent and very, very good. Personally, if they said, hey, we want you to do this Punisher show, uh, I would probably use this as the second season. I wouldn't start the show or maybe the second half of the first season. Um, but it's a great, great story. Parts of it were actually used in the 2004 Punisher movie. Um, Cap, uh, Cap, wow. Punisher, Frank Castle interrogates a guy with a blowtorch and a um, and an ice pop. I mean, a uh, like a fudge pop. That sounds weird. It's extremely well done. So that's in this story, the opening of Punisher War Zone. That's issues one through six. Then moving on to Punisher Max, which, as I mentioned, was a later series. This came out about mm, 10 or so years ago. And these were um, these were set apart from the superheroics of the Marvel Universe. So you might see Nick Fury in here, but that was it. And it's extremely violent, cursing, nudity, but really extremely well-written stories. The first one that I would recommend is called In the Beginning. It's the first arc, and it reestablishes Frank Castle in this kind of separate from the Marvel Universe uh, setting. And what it does is, is back in the 90s when Punisher became a regular, he got his own comic, he got not a sidekick, but he got a guy who helped him out, kind of like his Alfred. And his name was Microchip. That was his nickname. And he helped Frank on many of his missions for many years. They were they were kind of close, as close as you can be to Frank Castle. And in... Um, and then he disappeared for many years and, and was allegedly killed off. And then, of course, in Punisher Max, they didn't have to deal with that. So they said, no, he's still alive. And they dealt with what happens. What is the final microchip story? What, what happens between Frank and microchip uh, at the end of their relationship? Excellent storyline and some of the best action sequences in any comic I've ever seen. The other one that I would recommend the next one in Punisher Max is called Slavers, written by Garth Ennis, who also wrote in the beginning. Uh, he, he's written all of these Punisher Max stories, written uh, art by Leandro Fernandez. And the reason I mention the art here, I mean, it, all the art is great, but um, this storyline, very, very adult, very relevant, though two things that are going on now and have been going on for a while, and that is human trafficking sex slaves. And so Slavers deals with Frank Castle finding out that women 
uh, Russian women are being kidnapped and used as sexual slaves. And the, the brutal justice that he, you know, or vengeance, however you want to look at it, that he serves, I think is something that everybody hearing the horrors. And this is, you know, Ennis based this on real stories of women who've gone through this. Um. It, it's you know it's very sobering and it's one of the times where you cheer for a character like Frank Castle because it's kind of cathartic because you see the horror of this and you go how do you deal with this what can I do about it and a character like the Punisher helps us to kind of you know kind of feel some sense of I guess relief about it at least I don't want to you know this isn't Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil here but it is a great storyline uh, very brutal again do not give these to children you treat these as R-rated movies uh, the next one is a Punisher Max arc called Mother Russia. It has a cameo. Um, he's very integral to the plot, a version of the original Nick Fury in the, the original Marvel Universe. And uh, Mother Russia is essentially when I remember reading it the first time and I thought this is a movie. This is perfect. The basic storyline is the Russians have developed a bioweapon and they for some reason the scientists who developed it knew that other people were going to try and steal it and then kill him and so he implants this weapon. He injects it into his daughter and it, it doesn't kill her but she would be the carrier once, it, once she's activated. So the military Military, S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury and the U.S. government wants somebody to go get it. And Nick Fury's recommendation, the only man who can do this and get her out alive is Frank Castle, who, of course, is a criminal wanted on the FBI's most wanted list because he's basically a, a mass murderer. But they send Frank on this mission to get this girl. And that's where the story really you know, gets off the ground. Phenomenal stuff, man. And it has a very heart, um, very heart wrenching ending that you don't see coming, but it's beautifully done. So Mother Russia, highly recommended. The next one is not a Punisher Max story. This could not probably be a part of the Punisher series unless they do it as like a dream or uh, I don't know how they would do it, but it's called Punisher, a man named Frank. And what this was, was Marvel did a storyline kind of like what DC was doing in their comics around the same time where they would say, oh, Superman's ship didn't land in Smallville. It landed in Russia or it landed in Gotham City and and uh, the, the Waynes raised Kal-El to become Bruce Wayne, but he also had Superman's powers. It's an alternate version. So this is taking the story of Frank Castle and putting it in the Old West. And why that works is because, you know, Frank Castle's story is essentially a Western. When you think about it, you had the traditional Western story where you have the old gunslinger. He hangs up his guns. He gets married. He has a family. The family gets killed. And then he, he takes up the guns again and gets revenge. That's Frank Castle. That's his story right there. So make it into a Western comic. Art by the extremely talented legendary John Buscema and written by Chuck Dixon. Highly recommend finding this. It is a great, great fun done in one story. The other one that I would recommend, this is the last one on the list, Punisher Batman, also written by Chuck Dixon, art by John Romita Jr. Now, there was a time when Marvel and DC got along well enough as companies to actually do crossovers. That time has passed. This was in the, again, the 90s. And this was a great storyline that saw, because there was Batman Punisher and there was Punisher Batman. At the time, that they did the Batman Punisher storyline. Um, Bruce Wayne had been crippled by Bane. You're probably familiar with that. And then a guy named Jean-Paul Valley had taken over as Batman and he was crazy. And so he started killing people and Bruce had to come back and take back the role of Batman. So that first issue, which is the DC story, deals with Jean-Paul Valley Batman, who's pretty much like the Punisher, which is why it works, because it's like, look how bad this Batman is. He's pretty much like the Punisher, which is Bruce Wayne does not kill. Then they did Punisher Batman, which was the Marvel version, but Chuck Dixon had also been writing Batman at the same time, so he wrote this story, and it is one of the best Batman stories you'll ever read. Of course, he and Frank Castle don't get along. The Joker is the villain, and Jigsaw, who is kind of like Frank Castle's... You'll, If you read Circle of Blood, the initial first Punisher miniseries, you'll see how uh, he becomes the the, the um, anti... Oh, not the anti, the arch nemesis of Frank Castle, uh, Jigsaw. So great stuff. Great art. John Romita Jr. Don't think he does very well on superhero stuff like his Superman stuff is terrible, I think. But his run on Punisher and on this Batman 
uh, crossover phenomenal stuff. So check that out. Kids, that's all. You can find all of these on Amazon. And sometimes, oddly enough, eBay will be the better choice because you'll find it cheaper there. And uh, I, there are others I would recommend, but these were my top picks. Here's the thing. You can go search on eBay for Punisher 90s lots and you will find just you know 25 30 punisher comics from the 90s or the late 80s and in those there will be some gems you know so i i couldn't really go through and list every good storyline because we you know we'd have to do a series of episodes about that so check those out i'll have a link to these in the show notes for you we're going to take a break when we return it will be time to wrap up this week's episode of the big show with chris mo superheroes are modern day mythology well so what just how do Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man operate in the way of Heracles, Vishnu, or Odin? And why is that important? Tune into Iconicast and join three school teachers and lifelong geeks as we research, review, and discuss the iconic influence these characters have on our culture. Subscribe on iTunes or sign up for the notifications at IconicastPodcast.com. That's IconicastPodcast.com. Stay iconic! All right, folks, and we're back, and that was a promo for Iconicast. My friends over there, Michael, Sierra, and Al, recorded today their lead-up episode to Civil War. They were going to do a um, discussion of Captain America Winter Soldier. So check that out. It's coming out this week, I'm going to guess, right before uh, Civil War. They recorded it today. Be on the lookout for that. Michael and I will be doing another episode of Superman Lives probably next weekend, depending. We haven't talked yet, but it's about that time. We do a semi-monthly uh, podcast about Superman called Superman Lives. Links to that in the show notes as well. We've done two episodes so far. Big Show with Chris Mo returns next week. I ask that you check out Big Show Video. It is on the YouTubes. Just search Big Show Video, V-I-D-E-A-U-X, and you'll find my video content there. As I said, this week's episode is the first episode of the Big Show with Chris Mo, also on YouTube, and I'll have the Big Show Top 10 uh, as a segment on video uh, on Big Show Video as well. So check that out. Thanks so much to all of my supporters, the Big Show underwriters, everyone who's been encouraging. Thank you for your support. Please, best thing you can do to support the Big Show, tell somebody about it. Share a link. Uh, let them know about Big Show Video. And uh, that helps me because, you know, I love doing this show and it would be a dream to be able to do this uh, and make money from it and, and be able to do it much more that I do than I do now. Uh, so please uh, help with that vision. Share the big show with Chris Mo with people you know. How can you get in touch with me right after I am done yapping here in a few uh, minutes? You will hear a promo that gives you all the social media contact information for me. So you can let me know what you think about the show. You can ask questions. You will hear that coming up. Have a great rest of the weekend. Only a few hours left. Have a great week. Stay safe. And I'll be back next week with a spoiler-free review and discussion of Captain America Civil War. Until then, leave the places you go and the people you meet better than they were when you found them. Here, there is a veritable cornucopia, dare I say, a plethora of ways that you can get in touch with me through that newfangled social media. Facebook.com forward slash The Big Show. Remember, that's S H E A U X at Big Show on Twitter. Big Show Video on YouTube, that's V I D E A U X at Big Show on Instagram. And The Big Show with Chris Mo on Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs>